Book Three, Chapter Two of Ben Hur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Ben Hur, A Tale of the Christ, by Lew Wallace, Book Three, Chapter Two. The Tribune, standing upon the helmsman's deck with the Order of the Duumvir open in his hand, spoke to the chief of the rowers. Who is called the Hortator. What force hast thou? Of oarsmen two hundred and fifty-two, ten supernumeraries. Making reliefs of eighty-four. And thy habit? It has been to take off and put on every two hours. The Tribune mused a moment. The division is hard, and I will reform it, but not now. The oars may not rest day or night. Then to the sailing-master he said, "'The wind is fair. Let the sail help the oars.' When the two thus addressed were gone, he turned to the chief pilot, called Rector. "'What service hast thou had?' Two and thirty years.' "'In what seas chiefly?' "'Between our Rome and the East.' "'Thou art the man I would have chosen.' The Tribune looked at his orders again. Past the Campanile and Cape, the course will be to Messina. Beyond that, follow the bend of the Calabrian shore till Melito is on thy left. Then, knowest thou the stars that govern in the Ionian Sea? I know them well. Then from Melito, course eastward for Cythera. The gods willing, I will not anchor until in the Bay of Antimona. The duty is urgent. I rely upon thee. A prudent man was Arius, prudent, and of the class which, while enriching the altars at Preneste and Antium, was of opinion, nevertheless, that the favour of the blind goddess depended more upon the votary's care and judgment than upon his gifts and vows. All night, as master of the feast, he had sat at table, drinking and playing, yet the odour of the sea returned him to the mood of the sailor and he would not rest until he knew his ship. Knowledge leaves no room for chances. Having begun with the chief of the rowers, the sailing-master, and the pilot, in company with the other officers, the commander of the marines, the keeper of the stores, the master of the machines, the overseer of the kitchen or fires, he passed through the several quarters. Nothing escaped his inspection. When he was through, of the community crowded within the narrow walls, he alone knew perfectly all there was of material preparation for the voyage and its possible incidents. And, finding the preparation complete, there was left him but one thing further, thorough knowledge of the personnel of his command. As this was the most delicate and difficult part of his task, requiring much time, he set about it his own way. At noon that day the galley was skimming the sea off Pastium. The wind was yet from the west, filling the sail to the master's content. The watches had been established. On the foredeck the altar had been set and sprinkled with salt and barley, and before it the tribune had offered solemn prayers to Jove and to Neptune and all the Oceanidae, and, with vows, poured the wine and burned the incense. And now— the better to study his men, he was seated in the great cabin, a very martial figure. The cabin, it should be stated, was the central compartment of the galley, in extent quite sixty-five by thirty feet, and lighted by three broad hatchways. A row of stanchions ran from end to end, supporting the roof, and near the centre the mast was visible, all bristling with axes and spears and javelins. To each hatchway there were double stairs descending, right and left, with a pivotal arrangement at the top to allow the lower ends to be hitched to the ceiling, and, as these were now raised, the compartment had the appearance of a skylighted hall. The reader will understand readily that this was the heart of the ship, the home of all aboard, eating-room, sleeping-chamber, field of exercise, lounging-place off-duty, Use is made possible by the laws which reduce life there to minute details and a routine relentless as death. At the after end of the cabin there was a platform, reached by several steps. 
Upon it the chief of the rowers sat. In front of him a sounding-table, upon which, with a gavel, he beat time for the oarsmen. At his right a clepsydra, or water-clock, to measure the reliefs and watches. Above him, on a higher platform, well guarded by girded railing, the tribune had his quarters, overlooking everything, and furnished with a couch, a table, and a cathedra, or chair, cushioned, and with arms and high back, articles which the imperial dispensation permitted of the utmost elegance. Thus at ease, lounging in the great chair, swaying with the motion of the vessel, the military cloak half draping his tunic, sword in belt, Arius kept watchful eye over his command, and was as closely watched by them. He saw critically everything in view, but dwelt longest upon the rowers. The reader would doubtless have done the same, only he would have looked with much sympathy, while, as is the habit with masters, the tribune's mind ran forward of what he saw, inquiring for results. The spectacle was simple enough of itself. Along the sides of the cabin, fixed to the ship's timbers, were what at first appeared to be three rows of benches. A closer view, however, showed them a succession of rising banks, in each of which the second bench was behind and above the first one, and the third above and behind the second. To accommodate the sixty rowers on a side, the space devoted to them permitted nineteen banks separated by intervals of one yard, with a twentieth bank divided so that what would have been its upper seat or bench was directly above the lower seat of the first bank. The arrangement gave each rower when at work ample room, if he timed his movements with those of his associates, the principle being that of soldiers marching with cadenced step in close order. The arrangement also allowed a multiplication of banks, limited only by the length of the galley. As to the rowers, those upon the first and second benches sat, while those upon the third, having longer oars to work, were suffered to stand. The oars were loaded with lead in the handles, and near the point of balance hung to pliable thongs, making possible the delicate touch called feathering, but, at the same time, increasing the need of skill, since an eccentric wave might at any moment catch a heedless fellow and hurl him from his seat. Each oar-hole was a vent through which the labourer opposite had his plenty of sweet air. Light streamed down upon him from the grating which formed the floor of the passage between the deck and the bulwark above his head. In some respects, therefore, the condition of the men might have been much worse. Still, it must not be imagined that there was any pleasantness in their lives. Communication between them was not allowed. Day after day they filled their places without speech. In hours of labour they could not see each other's faces. Their short respites were given to sleep and the snatching of food. They never laughed. No one ever heard one of them sing. What is the use of tongues when a sigh or a groan will tell all men feel, while, perforce, they think in silence? Existence with the poor wretches was like a stream underground, sweeping slowly, laboriously, on to its outlet, wherever that might chance to be. O oh, son of Mary! The sword has now a heart, and thine the glory. So now. But, in the days of which we are writing, for captivity there was drudgery on walls, and in the streets and mines, and the galleys both of war and commerce, were insatiable. When Druilius won the first sea-fight for his country, Romans plied the oars, and the glory was to the rower not less than the marine. These benches, which now we are trying to see as they were, testified to the change come with conquest, and illustrated both the policy and the prowess of Rome. Nearly all the nations had sons there, mostly prisoners of war, chosen for their brawn and endurance. In one place a Briton, before him a Libyan, behind him a Crimean, elsewhere a Scythian, a Gaul, and a Thebesite. Roman convicts cast down to consort with Goths and Longobardi. Jews, Ethiopians, and barbarians from the shores of Maeotius. Here an Athenian, there a red-haired savage from Hibernia, yonder blue-eyed giants of the Cimbri. 
In the labour of the rowers there was not enough art to give occupation to their minds, rude and simple as they were. The reach forward, the pull, the feathering the blade, the dip, were all there was of it. Motions most perfect when most automatic. Even the care forced upon them by the sea outside grew in time to be a thing instinctive rather than of thought. So, as the result of long service, the poor wretches became imbruted, patient, spiritless, obedient, creatures of vast muscle and exhausted intellects, who lived upon recollections generally few but dear, and at last lowered into the semi-conscious alchemic state wherein misery turns to habit, and the soul takes on incredible endurance. From right to left, hour after hour, the tribune, swaying in his easy chair, turned with thought of everything rather than the wretchedness of the slaves upon the benches. Their motions, precise and exactly the same on both sides of the vessel, after a while became monotonous, and then he amused himself singling out individuals. With his stylus he made note of objections, thinking, if all went well, he would find among the pirates of whom he was in search better men for the places. There was no need of keeping the proper names of the slaves brought to the galleys as to their graves. So, for convenience, they were usually identified by the numerals painted upon the benches to which they were assigned. As the sharp eyes of the great man moved from seat to seat on either hand, they came at last to number sixty, which, as has been said, belonged properly to the last bank on the left-hand side, but, wanting room aft, had been fixed above the first bench of the first bank. There they rested. The bench of number sixty was slightly above the level of the platform, and but a few feet away. The light glinting through the grating over his head gave the rower fairly to the tribune's view, erect, and like all his fellows, naked, except the cincture about the loyans. There were, however, some points in his favour. He was very young, not more than twenty. Furthermore, Arius was not merely given to dice. He was a connoisseur of men physically, and when ashore indulged a habit of visiting the gymnasia to see and admire the most famous athlete. From some professor, doubtless, he had caught the idea that strength was as much of the quality as the quantity of the muscle, while superiority in performance required a certain mind as well as strength. Having adopted the doctrine, like most men with a hobby, he was always looking for illustrations to support it. The reader may well believe that while the tribune, in the search for the perfect, was often called upon to stop and study, he was seldom perfectly satisfied, in fact, very seldom held as long as on this occasion. In the beginning of each movement of the oar, the rower's body and face were brought into profile view from the platform. The movement ended with the body reversed, and in a pushing posture. The grace and ease of the action at first suggested a doubt of the honesty of the effort put forth, but it was speedily dismissed. The firmness with which the oar was held while in the reach forward, its bending under the push, were proofs of the force applied. Not that only, they as certainly proved the rower's art, and put the critic in the great armchair in search of the combination of strength and cleverness which was the central idea of his theory. In course of the study, Arius observed the subject's youth. Wholly unconscious of tenderness on that account, he also observed that he seemed of good height, and that his limbs, upper and nether, were singularly perfect. The arms, perhaps, were too long, but the objection was well hidden under a mass of muscle, which in some movements swelled and knotted like kinking cords. Every rib in the round body was discernible, yet the leanness was the healthful reduction so strained after in the pelistre. And altogether there was in the rower's action a certain harmony, which, besides addressing itself to the tribune's theory, stimulated both his curiosity and general interest. Very soon he found himself waiting to catch a view of the man's face in full. The head was shapely and balanced upon a neck broad at the base, but of exceeding pliancy and grace. The features in profile were of oriental outline, 
and of that delicacy of expression which has always been thought a sign of blood and sensitive spirit. With these observations, the tribune's interest in the subject deepened. "'By the gods,' he said to himself, "'the fellow impresses me. He promises well. I will know more of him.' Directly the tribune caught the view he wished, the rower turned and looked at him. "'A Jew and a boy!' Under the gaze then fixed steadily upon him, the large eyes of the slave grew larger. The blood surged to his very brows, the blade lingered in his hands. But instantly, with an angry crash, down fell the gavel of the hortator. The rower started, withdrew his face from the inquisitor, and, as if personally chidden, dropped the oar half-feathered. When he glanced again at the tribune he was vastly more astonished. He was met with a kindly smile. Meantime the galley entered the Straits of Messina, and, skimming past the city of that name, was after a while turned eastward, leaving the cloud over Etna in the sky astern. Often as Arius resumed to his platform in the cabin he returned to study the rower, and he kept saying to himself, "'The fellow hath a spirit. A Jew is not a barbarian. I will know more of him.' End of chapter.